Sa kasaysayan ng Pilipinas, maraming mga huwaran na maaaring tularan ng mga Pilipino. Mayroong mga lumaban, may mga namuno, at may mga namatay para sa bayan. Mayroon din namang mga nagbigay ng inspirasyon sa kapwa. Kabilang sa kanila, si Jesse Robredo. Ipinanganak si Jesse Sanaga Noong ika-27 ng Mayo, isang libo, siyam naraan, limamput walo. Dahil sa pagsusumikap ng kanyang mga magulang, nakapagpundar sila ng ilang mga negosyo. Dahilan upang lumaki si Jesse sa maalwang pamumuhay. Sa kabila nito, nanatili siyang mapagpakumbaba at may patas na pagtingin sa kapwa. Pinaghusayan ni Jesse ang kanyang pag-aaral nang magtapos sa kolehiyo sa pamantasang De La Sal, Maynila noong isang libo siyam naraan at walumpu. Dalawa ang nakamit niyang degreeing Bachelor ng Aghang. Isa sa inhenyeriyang mekanikal at isa pa sa inhenyeriyang pangangasiwa pang industriya. Noong isang libo siyam naraan at walumput lima, Nakamit niya ang kanyang masterado sa pangangasiwa ng negosyo mula sa Universidad ng Pilipinas, Diliman, Lungsod, Quezon. Mayroon din siyang masterado sa pangangasiwang pampubliko mula sa John F. Kennedy School of Government ng Harvard University sa Estados Unidos noong isang libo siyam naraan at siyam naput siyam. Nakatulong ang mga napag-aralan ni Jesse upang maging mahusay na administrador. Nagsimula siya bilang materials controller sa Carnation Philippines. Matapos ang tatlong buwan, lumipat siya sa San Miguel Corporation. Naging sunod-sunod ang kanyang promosyon doon. Matapos ang ilang buwan, ipinadala siya sa isang planta ng sorbetes sa San Fernando La Union, kung saan inayos niya ang paraan ng pagbobodega at pagpoproseso ng mga papeles. Bagamat abala sa trabaho, lumahok din si Jesse sa mga protesta laban sa mga kalabisan ng diktaduryang Marcos. Dahil sa pag-asang idinulot ng People Power Revolution noong isang libo siyam naraan at walumput anim, naganyak si Jesse na maglingkod sa pamahalaan. Itinalaga siya ni Pangulong Corazon Cojanco Aquino bilang direktor ng Bicol River Basin Development Program. Pinangasiwaan ng tanggapan ang mga pagpapagawa ng infrastruktura sa ilang mga bayan sa Camarines Sur at Albay. Nang mahalal bilang alkalde ng Naga noong isang libo siyam naraan at walumpot walo, naging desidido si Jesse na baguhin ang pamahalaan sa lungsod ng Naga Pinabilis niya ang mga proseso ng pamahalaang panglungsod upang agarang matugunan ang mga pangangailangan ng mga mamamayan. Ginawa niyang computerized ang sistema ng paniningil ng buwis. 
Tiniyak niyang kakayahan at hindi padrino ang magiging batayan sa pagpili sa mga ipapasok at ipopromote na empleyado sa pamahalaang panglungsod. Pinabuti rin ni Jesse ang pang-araw-araw na buhay ng mga taganaga. Nilabanan niya ang sugal at droga. Inilipat ang mga terminal ng bus at jeep malayo sa sentro upang maibsan ang trapiko. At hinikayat ang pamumuhunan sa negosyo sa Naga. Binigyan din niya ng matitirhan at dagdag pang tulong ang mga maralitang tagalunsod. Dahil sa mahusay na pakikisama ni Jesse, madali niyang nahikayat ang kanyang mga kababayan na tumalima sa mga pagbabagong kanyang ninais. Nakihalubilo siya sa mga karaniwang taganaga at hinayaan niya ang mga itong bumisita sa kanyang tanggapan. Kapag may sakuna, isa siya sa mga unang tumutulong. Pinahalagahan ni Jesse ang pagtutulungan at konsultasyon upang makabuo ng mga programang pakikinabangan ng lahat. Nagtatag siya ng mga kapisanan upang tuwirang makipag-ugnayan sa mga karaniwang mamamayan. Itinatag din niya ang People's Council na nagpapayo sa pamahalaang panglungsod. Binubuo ito ng mga kinatawan mula sa iba't ibang sektor ng lipunan at ng mga non-governmental organizations. Nakipagkita rin si Jesse sa mga alkalde ng mga katabing bayan at binuo ang Metro Naga Development Council. Layunin itong makipagtulungan upang umunlad ang kanikanilang mga bayan. Dahil sa mga nakamit niya bilang alkalde, Itinalaga si Jesse bilang kalihim ng kagawaran ng interior at pamahalaang lokal ni Pangulong Binigno S. Aquino III noong siyam ng Hulyo, taong 2010. Bilang kalihim, nagpatupad si Jesse ng full disclosure policy kung saan kailangan ilahad ng mga unit ng lokal na pamahalaan kung paano nila ginagastos ang kanilang pondo. Sa pagkakaloob ng Performance Challenge Fund, Nahikayat ang mga alkalde at gobernador na pagbutihin pa ang pamamalakad sa kanilang mga nasasakupan. Iginawad din niya ang seal of good housekeeping sa mga maayos na unit ng lokal na pamahalaan. Pinabuti ni Jesse ang kapulisan upang higit pang sugpuin ang kriminalidad. Nakatanggap ng mas mataas na sweldo ang mga pulis. Dumaming pulis ang nakatanggap ng pistola. At dumami rin ang ipinaparonda kaysa dati. Sa pamumuno ni Jesse, nakabili ng mas murang truck ng bumbero, nakapagpatayo ng mas maraming kulungan, at nakapagpadigitize ng mga record ng mga bilanggo. Sa gitna ng napakarami niyang tungkulin, naglaan pa rin si Jesse ng sapat na panahon para sa kanyang asawang si Lenny at ang kanilang tatlong anak, si Aika, Trisha at Jillian. Nung alkalde pa siya, sinikap ni Jesse na makauwi sa tanghalian at hapunan upang makasama silang kumain. Noong kalihim na siya ng DILG, sinikap din ni Jesse makasama ang pamilya sa pagtatapos ng linggo at kapag may mga holiday at espesyal na okasyon. Sa pagnanais na makasama ang pamilya sa mahabang weekend, umuwi si Jesse Panaga mula Cebu noong ikalabing walo ng Agosto, taong dalawang libo at labing dalawa. Sa kasamaang palat, bumagsak ang eroplanong kanyang sinasakyan sa dagat malapit sa Masbate. Malaki man o maliit, ginawa ni Jesse ang lahat ng kanyang makakaya upang mapabuti ang buhay ng kanyang kapwa. Ang mga aral na iniwan niya at ang mga pamantayan ng isang pagiging pinuno na kanyang itinakda at isinabuhay ay nananatili sa puso at isip hindi lamang sa mga taganaga, kundi ng maraming mga Pilipino. Marami po kaming umaasa na ang pagbabago sa bansang ito hindi lamang manggagaling sa mga taong may tungkulin at hinalal, kundi sa mga ordinaryo mamamayan.
Jos Marahinaaga sa Induga Boss. Good morning, everyone. I hope you are all well and safe. I am Francis E. Moraleda from the Museo ni Jesse Robredo. Welcome to this day's webinar entitled Bandera, What Makes a Good Local Government Flag, sponsored by the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, Museo ni Jesse Robredo. Like a good leader or hero, a good city or town flag has the power to inspire pride of place. It promotes a locality's identity with which residents can identify with. Unfortunately, most flags of local government, of government units in the Philippines are what vexillologists call seals on a bedsheet. In celebration of the National Flag Days and Secretary Jess M. Robredo's 63rd birth anniversary, we recognize his efforts to make local governments better by offering this free webinar. This webinar aims to increase awareness of the importance of local government flags and to encourage citizens to propose good local LGU flags. We are currently live at the Facebook pages of the following museums. Museo ni Jesse Robredo, Museo ni Jose Rizal Dapitan, Museo ng Kasaysayang Boholano, Museo ni Nahuan at Antonio Luna, Museo ng Kasaysayang Pang-Ekonomiya ng Pilipinas, at NHCP Museums. If you have questions for our speaker today, kindly send it to us by using the comments section on our Facebook Live. After the program, a link for the evaluation form will be posted at the comments section of our Facebook Live. Kindly accomplish it if you want to receive an e-certificate. So without further ado, I now give the floor to the Shrine Curator, of the Museo ni Jesse Robredo, Mr. Mark Anthony Glorioso, for his message. Thank you very much, Francis. A pleasant morning to all of us. In behalf of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, I would like to thank you all for participating in this webinar entitled Bandera, What Makes a Good Local Government Plan? Throughout the history of humanity, flags have been used to represent the country and its people. Flags were often seen as a patriotic symbol and was regarded with high respect. If we look back in our nation's history, our national flag was born in the heat of a revolution. Therefore, its first unfurling after Aguinaldo's victory at Alapan on the 28th of May, 1898, also signifies the birth of a new nation. Aside from the national flag, other official flags were later introduced in the Philippines. Uh, first in 1946, after we gained our independence from the United States, the governmental flag for the president and vice president of the Philippines were first introduced, along with the flag of the Supreme Court and the flag of the Court of Appeals. Then, after the Marcos administration, the flag of the Senate President of the Philippines and flag of the Speaker of the House were also used. Of course, we have also the military flags for different branches of the army. But in this webinar, we will be focusing on the local government unit flags, their significance, usage, functions, and their role in history. So stay with us until the end. and. Uh, we will try to answer your questions later on during the Q&A. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce our resource speaker. He is currently an assistant professor at the College of Arts and Sciences, University of Nueva Cáceres, and learning supervisor for accountancy, business, and management. He is currently taking Doctor of Philosophy, major in educational leadership and management. In 2017, he received the Mayoral Award from the uh, Naga City LG. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our resource speaker, Mr. Aldrin A. Alcantara. In line with 
with the celebration of National Flag Days and the 63rd birth anniversary of Jesse M. Robredo, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, in partnership with the Museo Ni Jesse Robredo, welcome you to this webinar, Bandera, What Makes a Good Local Government Flag? It is my hope that at the end of this talk, we are able to increase the awareness in the study of Philippine flags, identify the different types of designs in local government flags, and to encourage citizens to propose good LGU flags to inspire fellow residents and raise their pride of place. Again, the title of our webinar is Bandera, What Makes a Good Local Government Flag? Here are the topics for this day's webinar. First is the study of flags. Next is the significance of a flag. Next would be the local government flag and the basics of flag design. First, let me introduce myself. I am Aldrin Alcantara. I am a learning supervisor in the senior high school department and an assistant professor in the College of Arts and Sciences and College of Education of the University of Neva Cáceres. I took my Master's of Arts in Education major in History, and now I am currently taking Doctor of Philosophy major in Educational Leadership and Management. We return to our topic, the study of flags, as our first or introductory concept that we're going to talk about. Let's talk about vexillology. What is vexillology? It is the study of the history, symbolism, and usage of flags, or by extension, any interest in flags in general. Now, if you are interested in creating a flag, designing a flag, and you have a particular interest in collecting flags, whether it be organizational, national, and famous flags of the countries of the world, then you are entering into vexillology. But etymologically speaking, what is vexillology? It is a word which is a synthesis of the Latin word vexillium. If we are to return to history, vexillium is a square flag which was carried by Roman cavalry. And the Greek word or suffix logia, which means to study. Hence, we have what we call vexillology. A person who studies flags is what you call a vexillologist. One who designs flags is a vexillographer. And the art of flag designing is called vexillography. If we remember again from history, our national flag was designed by no less than General Emilio Aguinaldo, which makes him technically a vexillographer. One who is a hobbyist or general admirer of flags is what you call a vexillophile. Now, it is a term coined by American flag historian and expert Whitney Smith in 1958. Whitney Smith is also the founder of the American Vexillological Association. And in his expertise, in his long time expertise, he was able to advise those that have created numerous flags for different countries, different organizations, and different entities. So ladies and gentlemen, before I proceed with the next topic, I would like to dissect the idea of the flag or the object which is the flag. Let's talk about the anatomy of the flag. Now, usually a flag is red or seen from left to right. Now, the pole nearest to the flag is what you call the hoist. And moving from left to right, the left-hand corner is what you call the canton. Now, most of the symbols and figures are found in the canton. 
For example, the stars in the United States flag can be seen on the area where the canton is. Now, the rest of the flag, as we move again from left to right, is what you call the field or ground. Most of the, or the remaining elements should be in the field or the ground. Now, again, as I have said, uh, we read the flag from left to right. And the one attached is what you call the hoist and the one that flaps or is waved or go, go, goes, to the, goes with the wind is what you call the fly. Now, the pole in vexillological terms is what you call the flag pole. It could be the flag staff or it could be the mast. And the cord that attaches the flag to the flag pole or the mast is what you call the halyard. Now let us um, remember these uh, terms because we are going to return to them later on as we discuss further in our topic on local government unit flags. Now, a flag is a very small piece of cloth. Yet, why is it so significant to people and to organizations? Let's talk about the significance of flags. Now, flags and banners have been used for thousands of years and mean differently for different people. They are displayed to represent entities. The main function of a flag is to represent something. It is, in other words, representation by cloth or identity in cloth. Again, a very small piece of cloth with figures and colors, yet it represents entities. But what entities? It could represent a country. It could represent a state. It could represent a business, a leader, a community, or an organization. So that is the first function of the flag the flag being a representation. In its form and appearance, a flag is quite phenomenal. Take note that this is a very small piece of cloth with colors and figures, yet it's quite phenomenal. In what sense? With just a few simple shapes and colors, millions of people can be represented at a glance. Good brands like Good Flags perform the same function. It is phenomenal in the sense that these few colors and few figures represent something. And most especially, flags represent cultures. Flags represent identities. And so when you see a flag, in an instant, you can see the culture it represents, like famous international brands, small figures, bold colors, yet in an instant, you can identify the product or the item it represents. In as much as the same, the same function of the flag as a representation of entities and organizations. They are visual symbols used for identification. Aside from representation, they are identification. Identification of what? They are symbols of and respect for the ideals that the, identifi the identified organization stands for. For example, the Philippine flag is a symbol of liberty, strength, and unity, a source of pride and inspiration for Filipino citizens. That is why whenever we see a flag, especially the Philippine national flag in for example, sporting events, international affairs, there is a sense of pride because we see in the flag the culture and the identity and the pride of being a Filipino. So that's how important or significant a flag is. It identifies. It identifies collectively the person it wants to signify. Okay? Now, that, now that we're done with the debunking the concept of vexillology, 
and the significance of flags, let's talk about the local government flag. Our topic this day is all about flags in relation to how local government units can use them. Now, let's go back to the purpose and the usage of the government flag. What are LGU flags? The flags of the local government units of the Philippines are the vexillological devices used by the various cities, municipalities, and countries or provinces in the country. These are the, again, these are the vexillological devices, which means that they represent either the municipality, the country, or the province, or the city. These are what you call the local government unit flags. Now, most of the provincial flags, by virtue of bearing the corporate seal of the LGU, are solely intended to represent the local government wherever they are displayed. Which is why, ladies and gentlemen, most local government units tend to have their official seal as their emblem or as their symbol in their flags or in their LGU flags. Because the purpose of the LGU flag is to represent the local government itself and not meant to be adopted by the public for general use. Again, let us return to the purpose of the flag. It is for representation. It is for identification, which means that for you to identify the LGU, you must place in the flag symbols that would readily identify or represent the LGU. And again, it's not a representation of individual components of the LGU. It is a representation of the LGU in general. Now, such flags only find usage within LGU premises. Now, because LGU flags cannot be used by the public it will only within LGU premises. For example, municipal or city halls, government offices in the halls of the Sangguniang Panlalawigan or Panlungsog in their chambers, or LGU-owned sports or recreational facilities, and are most visible to the public during events involving the LGU like charter anniversaries, foundation anniversaries, parades, military parades, or any major event sponsored by the LGU, the LGU flag is there. Which means that the flag cannot be used for public use. For example, you attach the LGU flag in your um, jeepney or in your public transport. Again, the flag does not represent the person, but the organization. The designs of many of these government flags can be easily changed between administrations. Take note that at each passing administration, the politician or the representative of the party has a banner color. Diba? Um, may mga politiko na kumakampanya sa ilalim ng ganitong kulay or ganitong simbolo. And when they win in the elections or when they sit as, as executives of the local governments, they too create this emblem of themselves or they share or they influence the color of the LGU with their banner color. Especially when the seal itself is altered or at times they reflect what we call the personal preferences of the governor or mayor in power. So yeah, we, the local government unit can change the design, they can change the color based on the preferences of the executive sitting during that period. The flags of some provinces have what we call provincial boards or Sangguniang Panlalawigan resolutions or ordinances specifying their designs and specifications, which means that any alteration, whether it be an alteration in the symbols, alteration in the color, alteration in the total design, 
cannot be easily done, but it has to undergo the amending or repealing previous legal enactments. Because again, some of these LGU flags are encased in local ordinances or the design or the appearance of these flags are safeguarded by legislations, which means that any alterations whatsoever shall be done through the amendment or the repealing of previous legal enactments. So that's how some of the local government unit flags are changed. Now, some flags with legally specified designs, for example, those of Bohol, Bukidnon, and Southern Leyte are allowed to be adopted by the general public as a symbol of civic pride for the province and thus serve dual purpose as both a government and a civic flag. Now, taking into account the example that I've placed here, um, like Bohol, Bukidnon, and Southern Leyte, they have what you call civic flags and these are authorized by the local government to be used by the people and to be used respectively. Um, of course, like our Philippine national flag, the LGU flags are also accorded with respect and dignity, which means that although the people are allowed to use them, I know there, there is a civic use of these LGU flags, due respect should be accorded to these symbols of the local government. Now, we are done with the concept of vexillology. We are done with the significance of the flag, and we have also discussed the local government flag. Let's continue with our discussion on the bas basics of flag design. Now, in this segment, I want to emphasize the five principles of the basic flag design. Now, these basic principles were laid out by the North American Vexillological Association, or NAVA, and is a, some sort of a guide for all organizations which are gearing towards the creation of their own flags, representations, and identification of their organization. Now, in this particular discussion on the basic principles, I will not be showing you actual LGU flags because I do not want to use LGU flags as models of whether it can be the right um, figure, it can be the wrong figure, but I will all, only lay down the basic principles of flag design. And there are only five, ladies and gentlemen. Number one is keep it simple. Number two, Use meaningful symbolism. Number three, use basic colors. Number four, no lettering or seals. And number five, be distinctive or be related. Let's start with the first one. Keep it simple. The essence of the first principle is that the flag should be so simple that a child can draw it from memory. For example, you ask a child, can you draw the flag of Japan? Can you draw the flag of the United States? Or can you draw the flag of the Philippines? If the child readily draws the flag from memory, then we can say that the flag is simple enough to be distinguished. As we all know, flags flap, Flags drape and flags are seen from a distance and from the opposite side. These are the circumstances that you have to understand because simple designs make effective flags. The first thing that you have to consider is that your flag is not static, especially for LGU flags which are hoisted, for example, in front of the municipal or the city hall of public plazas in it. they are not static they are hoisted which means they are flapping they are draped 
or people can see it from a distance and people can see it on the opposite side. So these are the circumstances that we have to remember when designing our local government unit flag. Simplify, simplify flags by focusing on a single symbol. You can use few colors. And because the flag is seen at a distance, it is hoisted on a staff or a flagpole, it should have larger shapes and no lettering. Avoid the temptation to include a symbol for everything. This is the concern of most of the local government unit flags that we can see today because the natural default is the official seal of the local government becomes the official flag. However, when we return to the basic principles of flag design, we can see that it should have few colors, it should have larger shapes, and no or minimal lettering. And there is also this, this temptation to include symbols for everything. We understand the fact that as a province or as a city or a municipality, we would like to represent ourselves more, take pride of ourselves and reflect that on the flag that we're going to use or we're going to create. However, again, on the principle of simplicity, we cannot put all symbols in our flag. For example, um, I'm from the province of Kamarinesur and our products, if I should say, our prime commodities are, or prime export is pili, the pili nut, or the chili pepper, or the sili, or you, we can add their abaca, or we can, we can add their um, other native products. But these products, which are found in my province, cannot be placed in one flag because it will outdo or it will defeat the purpose of keeping the flag simple. The design will be reversible or at least recognizable from either side. So again, take note that because the flag is hoisted and it is seen from a distance and from various sides of, for example, the plaza or the town hall, then we can, see, we can say that it should have a recognizable design following the principle of simplicity. Okay, so again, number one principle on the five basic principles of flag design, keep it simple. Next would be use meaningful symbolism. In essence, the flag's images, colors, or patterns should relate to what it symbolizes. Now, what does this mean? What does the second principle mean? If we remember the definition of a flag, it is a visual representation. It is a graphic representation of an organization, of a country or a state, or in this case, the local government. And because it is a graphic and visual representation, it should be replete with symbolism. And not just any symbolism, but meaningful symbolism. Those symbols that add meaning to the identity of the province, of the town, or the city. So symbolism can be in the form of the charge or main graphic element. What figures are we going to use? What symbols? What objects are we going to place in the flag for it to give meaningful symbolism on the identity it represents? Or sometimes, even in the shapes or layout of the parts of the flag. For example, you are going to place an object there, or you're going to place two objects. One is bigger than the other. On the scale difference, or on the size difference, meron ang papasok na symbolism because the shape or the size and the scale it is placed on the flag or the scale being placed on the flag means that the size has a symbol that this particular object which is bigger 
has a bigger influence or a bigger symbol and a wider symbol that it represents. Usually, a single primary symbol is best. So if you would see other flags or flags of countries of the world, there are flags which only bear one symbol. For example, the flag of the the flag of Japan, for example, has only one red circle. That's just one symbol. It's a round circle on a white field. So what does this represent? So again, um, putting into putting into consideration the first principle of keeping it simple in its simplicity, it's just simply a red dot. It's a circle, it's a red circle. But what meaningful symbol does it bear? So that is the um, importance of the second principle, which means use meaningful symbolism. Again, avoid those that are less likely to be representative or unique. And of course, colors carry meaning. For example, in our national flag, we are, we are using the colors blue, red, white, and yellow. Red, which is a very strong color or a very strong hue, represents courage, bravery, sacrifice, blood, etc., and all of these um, related emotions. How about blue? Blue represents calmness, tranquility, peace, and all of these emotions attached to it. White, purity, cleanliness, yellow, strength, vitality, youthfulness, joy. So all of these colors have meaningful symbolism that we want to incorporate in the total meaning of the flag it and the organization that it represents. So that is number two. Next, use basic colors. Now the essence is limit the number of colors on the flag to three which contrast well and come from the standard color set. Now, of course, aesthetically speaking, the flag which is being hoisted and displayed publicly must be of very interesting and aesthetically correct colors. Not just the colors, of course, the colors that represents the local government that is very important, but also aesthetically, it should be pleasing to the eyes of those that will see it. Now, the basic flag colors are red, blue, green, black, yellow, and white. They can range from dark to light, which means that you can use basic colors with different hues. Remember, um, returning to my example on the Philippine national flag, before there were different shades of blue to be to be placed in the um, national flag. In going back to history, iba-ibang blue ang naging kulay ng watawat ng Pilipinas. But again, it, it follows the principle on basic colors. It might be different hues, but it also follows the basic elements of basic colors, okay? And until now, we have, we have very specific hues for, example, the national flag. So we are following this kind, this shade of blue, this shade of red, etc. They can range from dark to light. Occasionally, other colors are also used, such as purple, gray, and orange, but they are seldom needed in a good design. Now, another element which is very important when we create our local government unit flags is that when we reproduce them, they reproduce well in grayscale or in black and white shades. Because of course, um, the LGU flags might be printed or might be captured in photographs. And we have to take note that it should also be good in black and white. How is this possible? If you use too dark, colors, very dark colors, then the render of that in black and white would be very dark also. However, if you use very light colors, very light hues, the render of that would be very bright. 
Both cannot be seen in grayscale. More than four colors are hard to distinguish and make the flag unnecessarily complicated. Now, if you look at the national flags of other countries, you, may, you might say that it's quite complicated and you cannot, be, you cannot really draw it from memory because of the multiplicity of colors used. So that is the danger of using many colors. Um, people might not remember your banner or your flag, or people might not recognize at all the flag with which you intend to represent yourselves. Majority of national flags bear three to four colors. Now, let's go to the next principle, which is no lettering or seals. In essence, avoid using writing of any kind or an organizational seal. If you remember, I said a while ago that the default of the local government is to use their official seal as their official flag. However, following the basic principles on vexillological devices, let us return to the concept that a flag is a graphic symbol. Lettering is nearly impossible to read from a distance and difficult to reduce to lapel pin size. Words are not reversible. Take note, flags are flapping, they are hoisted, they are displayed, they are seen from afar, and they are seen on, other, on either side. So it means that if you put letters in it, in it or words in it, it would be very difficult for the people to notice or to identify the flag with which you intend to represent yourself. Similarly, on the obverse side, words are not reversible and it's quite hard to read reversed letters or figures. Don't confuse a flag with a banner. Okay, such as what is carried in front of a marching band in a parade or draped behind a speaker's platform. The difference between flags and banners is that banners are static. They are placed in a podium, then they are they are seen or they are seen in the front. They are front-faced objects, which means that you cannot see the obverse side. Such don't flap, they are seen from only one side and usually seen close up. This is where you can put letters, words, and sentences. However, you cannot place that in flags because, again, the flag is a moving object and it's quite difficult to distinguish or to read the letters if they are moving. Okay. The last would be be distinctive or be related. In essence, avoid duplicating other flags, but use similarities to show connection. What does this mean? The last element is perhaps the most difficult yet very important principle. Why is this so? Sometimes the good designs are already taken. You might design a flag, but in the end, you will realize that it is already existing. Okay? It is already used by other countries. For example, other local government units might be using this one. For example, you're going to place the tree or the Nara tree as a symbol. Then you come to realize that there are several local government units already using the Nara tree as their symbol as the symbol of their local government. However, a flag symbol, colors, and shapes can recall other flags. Your flag should be distinct, yet it should be related. Related to what? In this case, since we are in the local government unit, our flags should be related to our mother flag, which is the Philippine national flag. And there should be certain elements that we can see in the national flag that we can also see in your local government flag. 
because this creates a certain connectedness, a certain heritage, a certain solidarity with the mother flag. Of course, this cannot be done if you do not have knowledge of other flags and you have to return to history, to your country's history, to your local government's history, so that your elements are distinct yet they are related. Okay? Again, it is the most difficult principle, yet this is the most important. Because as we see or as the public sees the flag, the public would say that, ah, this flag is unique from the rest, but it somewhat resembles something or it somewhat resembles an already existing one. So that is the challenge, ladies and gentlemen, when you create your local government unit flags. Be distinctive or be related. Now, as a review of the concepts that we have discussed, we talked about the study of flags, the significance of a flag, the local government flag, and the basics of flag design. And I hope that this discussion on vexillology showed us or provided us insights on the importance of creating our local government unit flags. And we must all return to the basic concept that the LGU flag is not just a representation of the municipal hall, not just a representation of the governor, not just a representation of the city officials, but it is a representation of the people, the people's, the people and the people's identity as a community and as Filipinos. Again, ladies and gentlemen, this is our webinar, Bandera, What Makes a Good Local Government Flag? As we say here in the Bicol region, Dios mabalus po, maraming maraming salamat po.
especially in public places like um, in front of the halls, municipal, city, provincial halls. That's also the default because, um, for example, the uh, for example, the national flag is at the center of the uh, public plaza. The local government unit should be beside it and should be at a lower staff. From what from from my memory, oh no, from from what I understand because we are giving precedence to or importance to the national flag before the local government unit so so that's the that's the essence and i hope i answered the question um similarly uh, the general the general rule is like the like the honor reverence and the dignity that we accord the philippine national flag that is also the dignity respect and accord we give to the local government unit flag so thank you very much for that question Another question po, um, may ahensya po bang nag approve ng flag na ginagawa ng mga LGU or nag-register nito for authentication? Okay. Um, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, in the same heraldic code, there are no provisions, walang provision on flag design. Ang meron lang is the approval of the local government seal or the local government emblem that from, basing from are A8491, but I, I do not know if there are other legislations related to that. So basically, um, as of now, there are no agencies that would approve. That is why if you, if you pag, pag pinag sama sama mo ang mga local government unit flags, it's hard to distinguish. It's hard to, it's hard to decipher because many of the elements are the same. Many of the colors are the same. That's what, um, meaning there was no approving body. Um, it did not undergo a committee or a, a, a national um, approving body for its approval. So, yun lamang po. Um, another question po from an anonymous um, viewer. Anong organization ang pwedeng lapitan upang magpatulong sa paggawa or magpa-seminar ng mga flag for the LGUs? Okay, thank you very much for your question. Um, since we, since this uh, webinar is hosted by the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, it is also fitting that we can um, go to NHCP for advice or for lectures. Um, personally, I can give I can give my um, feedback on local government unit flags. But according to the North American Vexillological Association. Uh, local government unit flags must begin with the people. Sa madaling sabi is, dapat ang tao ang mag-suggest, ang mag, magbigay ng mga um, proposals for the creation of the local government unit flag because yun yung, yun yung representation nila, di ba? It's, it's not the representation of the politicians or the executives in power. Kaya, um, again, um, NHCP, or you can also... Um, ask for the assistance of the Department of Education in your locality because they are also um, knowledgeable in how your local governments can be well represented in your flags. Yun lamang po. Okay, we have another question, sir, okay. from Mr. Jerry Ilagan. I have a Deviant Art page, Ramones 1986. Okay. One of my posts are alternative Philippine provincial flags. If a certain provincial LGU saw one of these posts and decided to adapt it, will there be a sharing of copyright? Okay. Since, since local government unit flag should be unique, then it is the intellectual property, like any, like any item um, owned by an organization, an entity, or a person. It is guarded by the intellectual property rights. However, if, if these LGUs adapt your... Um, deviant art products or your designs without your consent or your permission, then they are, of course, they are liable because the principle of intellectual property is violated. Unless, of course, they seek your um, approval or your advice for the usage of that um, flag design. Thank you. Okay. So, ayan, sir, kanina nakamute pala tayo sa first question. So, um, uulitin ko lang po yung First question from Mr. Angel Rehidor. 
Okay. Is there a proper way of displaying the LGU flag in government offices? Okay, um, no problem. Um, for thank you very much again, um, Mr. Rehidor, for your question. We, for us to understand how we should display the local government unit flag, we should first understand how to um, display the Philippine national flag under the heraldic code of RA or RA eighty four ninety one. Whenever there are events, whenever there are engagements, the Philippine national flag is always hoisted, displayed on the right side, which means that in essence, the event is under the jurisdiction of the Philippines. With that in mind, yung LGU flag ninyo ay dapat nasa kaliwang bahagi or the left side. So that is the pairing of the of the two flags whenever there are important functions that deems it necessary for these two flags to be present. Um, ano pa, mga convo or mga motorcade where there is a need for a flag, the Philippine national flag is always on the right and then the local government unit flag is always on the left. When it is hoisted, especially in public places, usually the, the Philippine national flag is hoisted on a higher staff or mast mas mataas na flagpole kesa dun sa local government flag to, to denote the jurisdiction and the superiority of the Philippine national flag to the local government unit flag. Now, again, another, um, in essence, if there is respect, dignity, and honor due accorded to the Philippine national flag, that is the same respect, honor, dignity that we accord to the local government unit flag. For example, you cannot you cannot use it as an apparel. Hindi mo pwedeng gawing design sa damit, ilagay sa damit, ilagay sa sapatos, kotse, or what. So if there is no dignity to it, in as much as we put dignity on the national flag, then that is a violation of the law. So that is my take on that. Thank you very much. Sir Francis, I think you are on mute. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. I think yes. um, our final question for our webinar today is from Mr. Johans Hernando. Good morning. Are there any efforts for the NHGP to document existing LGU flags and relevant ordinances into one unified archive, especially that there is a lack of documentation online? Okay. Um, since there are no provisions in the heraldic code for the actual flag design, because I said earlier, right? more of the LGU seals, okay, and emblems. I think the, the position now of NHCP is more of the advisory, okay, and not the actual um, registration, I believe, or the documentation of these flags. Because in reality, the local government unit flags are proliferating. Ano, um, napakarami ng local government unit flags, um, they are, on their on their level on their local government level there are many revisions um umupo si ganito ang kanyang kulay ay ganito may simbolong idadagdag kasi hindi daw na incorporate ang ganitong community or whatever so more of the advisory on the level of the national historical commission however i hope in the coming in in the process of creating our vexillological devices i i hope that in time we could have a um, a set of guidelines an addition, an amendment to what is already existing so that talagang yung ating mga local government unit flags are fitting vexillological devices. Kasi again, I, I would like to stress out na the seal is not the flag. <laughs> that, that's the reality. Um, you, might, you might say that your seal is the most beautiful seal, but it cannot be the flag because the seal is, there is a wide gap that separates the flag and the seal. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hernando, for your um, query. Yeah, and thank you, sir. Um, yeah, and before we end the program, may mga few shout outs dito sa ating <laughs> Facebook Live from Mr. Jeric Ilagan, from Buwan, Abawan, Batangas, from Ms. Cristel May Pagikan, from Kidapawan City National High School in Cotabato. From Mr. Paolo Cabling from Baliwag Bulacan, and from our friends, ayan, si Mr. Yufemi Agbayani III, watching from Quezon City, hoping for more vexillologically pleasing town, city, and province flags. And of course, sa ating 
workers, Kapwa workers, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines from different shrines all over the Philippines, Mr. Ryan Tan, the curator po ng ating Museo sa Rizal sa Dapitan, ayan, and our friends from the head office, the different museums all over the Philippines, my friends here, my co-workers here in Naga City, Sir Mark and Joanne, our friends from the Vis from the Ilocos Norte, Naga, Visayas, Mindanao Cluster, hello sa inyo. I hope you're all well and safe in this time of pandemic. Now, we come to the presentation of the certificate to our um, speaker for today. This um, certificate of appreciation sharing with us your expertise um, on this topic. Um, to our dear participants, kindly accomplish the evaluation form posted on the comment section of the Facebook Live so that you, you'll receive an e-certificate a week from now. And then, that's it. Thank you everyone for attending the webinar hosted by the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, Mosey Nijesi Robredo. And have a safe and fun day to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.